Well, good afternoon. I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, I certainly did. And um, we are lucky today to have really a great set of speakers. Uh, thanks to FireEye for sponsoring the event. So when you bite on your sandwich, be sure and think of Dave. Uh, this is really a good panel. It's a good topic. Um, we are uh, excited to have this discussion. I, I'm excited anyhow. Uh, let me tell you the format. We're going to have two keynote speakers. Uh, Dave DeWalt, Chairman of the Board and CEO of FireEye, long experience in the industry. You all know his history. Um, successful IPO. Uh, unlike Facebook, it went up instead of down, so you've got to give him, <laughs> that's a good sign. Um, he will open. Followed by Jane Lute, who of course all of you also know, uh, President and CEO of the Council on Cybersecurity but of course the former Deputy Secretary at Homeland Security and one of the real drivers in the administration of cybersecurity policy. After our two keynotes, who will each speak for about you know, 20 minutes, um, we will have a panel with uh, a number of folks who have real expertise. I'll introduce them when we get up. Um, I'm, my job is mainly ornamental. I'm going to sit here and smile and, and introduce people. With that, why don't I ask if they don't mind if Dave and Jane could come on up here to the uh, head table? And then we can go ahead and get started. All right. Is it good morning or afternoon? I've lost track of time lately after this uh, IPO with FireEye. So I think I was, I was in Europe twice, the Middle East for eight days, back and forth to the East Coast, 15 cities on the IPO roadshow. I'm still a little you know, wondering which, uh, which time it is. But anyway, thank you, thank you for, for coming today, and it's uh, wonderful to be back with uh, CSIS. Uh, I was here a couple of months ago, but different facility and a, and a big improvement, so uh, kind of fun. Anyways, um, I want to try to do two things this morning, if I can, or afternoon, and uh, I want to I wanna give a little education as best as I possibly can in as, as layman way, but also in a technical way, just to help you understand the landscape that, I, that I'm seeing and then secondly, maybe a couple of ideas and recommendations of, uh, of some improvements that we could make if we're looking at our critical infrastructure uh, policies and our practices and maybe even our standards. And I'll, uh, I'll do that at the end here. But um, I have some unique views. Uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, being the chairman and CEO of FireEye, uh, I've got some unique uh, opportunities. Uh, spent a lot of time as chairman of Mandiant as well. I'm also on the, um, the board of directors of Delta Airlines, and I do safety and security for the airline, uh, CEO of McAfee for five years, and uh, a variety of other roles. So um, travel around and see lots of uh, security officers and uh, various types of companies. And what an amazing world we live in. The, uh, the advanced threats that are happening, particularly to critical infrastructure, are almost stunning. And I hope you don't get any indigestion after the next 17 minutes because uh, I probably will give it to you. Uh, it's pretty appalling to watch what's, what's happening out there. And uh, I'll give you, a, give you a visual or two, but ultimately I'm hoping that we can focus in on how we can strengthen the NIST framework and uh, some ideas to do so. So real quickly, you know, we've, we live in an amazing world, as I always like to say, and uh, the innovation that we are seeing is incredible. Everything we have in our world is, uh, is being reimagined just about every day, and that's kind of fun. Uh, I don't know how many cell phones you have, Jane, but uh, I have a few now, and uh, new applications all the time. But what's happened is all this innovation has created almost a perfect platform for the adversaries, and that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, the social networks that we see, the mobile computing environments that we see, the internet itself, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of new computing has just created this very easily accessible and attacked infrastructure. And of course, what is every company having to do? Try to keep up culturally with adapting all this innovation. And if you're a CIO in almost any Fortune 500 or Global 2000 company, all your employees are asking you, can I have the new iPhone? Can I have a new social network? Can I have this or that? And of course, the pressure to adopt all this technology is uh, creating literally uh, a perfect platform for the adversaries to leverage. And you know, I'm probably speaking to the choir, but when you look at um, the companies that are breached, it's scary. And the level of depth of the breach is pretty unbelievable. 
Uh, thousands of critical infrastructure companies, as I stand here today, are breached. They're substantially breached. And I don't mean they're, they're losing uh, PCI data or some sort of privacy information. I'm talking they're losing their core intellectual property. Uh, their networks are compromised. They're owned by the adversaries. Many of these adversaries are nation state adversaries. Uh, we, uh, my companies, have walked into thousands of companies now, literally thousands, and almost every company, 95 plus percent of them, have been substantially breached. So our current systems aren't working too well. Our current controls aren't working very well. Our best practices aren't working well. And what you're seeing is the offense and the defense have got highly dislocated. And the offense and the adversaries are easily able to defeat the defensive architectures that we have out there. And uh, you can see here just from you know, what I'm showing, obviously a lot of espionage activities, intellectual property loss, uh, hardly measurable, but obviously in hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, very attacks, very advanced attacks from China. Uh, serious cyber sabotage kinds of scenarios unfolding, uh, crime activities unfolding, and not to paint too dire of a picture, but when you compound the fact that now the adversaries are sharing and you've created a capitalistic community where you can purchase advanced weaponry and advanced malware kits on the black market, you end up having a, a situation where these advanced uh, attacks in the hands of the wrong individuals uh, create uh, a potentially catastrophic scenario. So uh, it is what it is, and again, not to, not to uh, harp on it too much, but you know, when you look at defense in depth not keeping up, uh, we've really created almost the perfect platform for our defense to be defeated. And uh, after five years at McAfee, I've come to realize this a little bit. Uh, we preached for years defense in depth, defense in depth. And we've created that. Just about every layer of the architecture, from firewalls to intrusion detection prevention systems, to web gateways, email gateways, to host security, we put in lots of defense architecture. But what's the Achilles heel that's in that entire defense and depth architecture? We have the exact same detection engine at every layer of the architecture. I call it the Maginot line. Everybody knows the French history lesson there a little bit. And uh, we have a situation where the adversaries basically can get around our defense and depth architecture because the exact same signature-based blacklisting model for detection is in place at every level of defense. And if you can evade that architecture, you've defeated the entire model. So what's happened? Offense and defense, highly dislocated. Every couple minutes, you're seeing a successful attack. 95% of the companies are compromised. And it's very simple to uh, breach the systems. An oldie but goodie right now is spear phishing. And uh, all I have to do is send you a little LinkedIn uh, reminder of our meeting today, along with a web link. You click on that link, I can infect your system, I can steal your credentials, and I can log in as you. So we end up having a, a perfect platform of innovation that now has created a, a pretty untenable scenario for our adversaries and for our situation. So what's new? The threat scan landscape is dramatically changed. You all know this, the persistency of the actors is different. The amount of funding that's going in to the adversaries is dramatic. We're talking tens of thousands of cyber warriors being created in various intelligence agencies around the world. Uh, the arms race for intelligence is dramatic at this stage of the game. And we have a whole new breed of types of attacks that are occurring. They're no longer little attachments that I send to you that we could use a model to block and, and uh, measure against. We now have highly obfuscated executables that are running inside code and in memory. They're talking to sophisticated command and control servers. And these architectures are being deployed in nearly every company in our critical infrastructure today. And if you look at the adversaries, many of the adversaries are lined up as account teams, as research teams focused on individual companies that are part of our critical infrastructure. It is the facts, and that's the reality of what we're seeing. So what ends up happening, they leverage a model like I'm showing on the screen. All these products that we've deployed and the recommendations and controls that we've put in place create a defense in depth architecture that has lots of point products and what do the adversary do? They come in one vector and out another vector. 
I send you an email through one protocol, I get you to click on a link, and it goes out another protocol, and exploits the fact that these two products don't communicate to one another. The email gateway doesn't talk to the web gateway, doesn't talk to the host security, and we end up having fabrics that are under attack that are easily evaded. And so if you're a chief security officer today and you've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on security and you're seeing the success that the adversaries are having, it's a, it's a pretty unique uh, problem. And uh, this is the state of which we're in. And of course, the more devices we bring in, tablets we bring in, mobile computing or cloud-based computing environments we bring in, it just creates the situation uh, a little bit greater and greater. So there is a lot we can do about it, and that's what I want to focus on in a second, but I'll show you an example or two here. I'm not sure if this shows up, but this is a live map. Well, it was a live map yesterday, but uh, the map is really just pulled directly from my, my company, FireEye, and what you see is a cyber map of all the command and control servers that are live as of a couple days ago. And if you uh, just sort of get a little illustration up in the one corner, I don't have a monitor here I can see, but you'll see a couple numbers. Just during that day, over 300,000 attacks that were talking successfully, successfully out of American command and control servers and critical infrastructures, 100 plus million of these attacks year to date that were successfully evading the defense in depth architectures that are out there, just to give you the size. If you look in the other corner, probably can't see that, 90% of these attacks are leveraging APTs or advanced threats. So you now have hundreds of thousands these a day on our critical infrastructure, 90% of them are advanced attacks and they're successful. It gives you live data illustrations of the problem. If you look down here, you can see, well, you might be able to see, but I'll tell you, most of them are uh, industries that are in the critical infrastructure in America today. So these are you know, high tech, transportation, uh, defense industrial base, energy, and uh, the list goes on. And you can see the amounts of attacks are measured in uh, tens of thousands uh, on a daily basis. So pretty sobering and unfortunately uh, very true. And if you sort of look at the campaigns, uh, they're very deep and wide uh, across uh, a number of industries and verticals. And uh, the adversaries are after the innovation that's created here. So you see high tech, uh, and some of these are advanced persistent threats names, and you can see them. Some of you might know Ghostrat. If you don't know these terms, these are remote access tools that are deployed uh, very successfully into our infrastructure, and uh, the list goes deep almost in every industry. So designed malware for industry attacks that have a very complicated, persistent, and advanced methodology that uh, are in active use uh, as, we, as we speak. One example of this, uh, many of you might know, is uh, what we called Operation B-Bus. Uh, Operation B-Bus was a uh, very successful attack on our defense uh, infrastructure, our defense industrial base, particularly after UAVs and drones. And uh, this attack used spear phishing. And uh, just to show you a little how it worked, uh, a weaponized email was sent through a socially engineered lookup on LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, they figured out who had access to the systems, sent them an email, had an attachment to it. That person opened up that email. That email ultimately talked back to a command and control server, and that activity then leveraged a cryptography that was uh, never seen before, highly advanced cryptography, and suddenly the malware was erased, and ultimately the credentials stolen, and ultimately the intellectual property stolen as well. And we ended up with an extremely successful attack, uh, very organized attack on some of the core defense intelligence that we have in our architecture today. And uh, the impact of this was pretty dramatic. Some of you might have seen it. We now have a, a major competitor in the UAV market and uh, launched just recently in China. And now we see uh, an industrial hub copied and counterfeited uh, almost to the T in months. So this is the world we live in, where if I can steal intellectual property from my neighbor, I can replicate that technology, I can gain an advantage, and uh, suddenly the stakes are much different than today. So this is a pretty public one. There's uh, many, many hundreds more that we could show you like this, 
where the race uh, for the innovation and the uh, distilling of that information is uh, at a whole new level. So there's a lot we can do to solve this problem. Education is critical. Is it going on? How's it going on? What type of attacks are happening? And what are we going to start to do to fix these things? The very first thing I would tell you is we have to think a little differently about the controls that we're recommending and implementing. Antivirus today, and this comes from a person who pushed this technology for five years, is having significant trouble keeping up with these attacks. If we continue to recommend the same type of control, we're going to get the same type of result that I just showed you. We have to augment this with new detection methodologies that are, uh, are available, uh, detonation chambers, sandboxes, uh, it doesn't matter the terminology, but we need a new way to study the behaviors of these attacks. And we have to implement that and recommend that as a core part of what we're doing in principles moving forward. Second thing that I would tell you has to happen is we have to create ways to put in place uh, multi-factored authentication. Uh, if any of you read the Mandiant report, the APT1 report, uh, nearly 100%, in fact, I think 100% of all the attacks came through spear phishing. So the idea there, just like I showed you on BBUS, was if I can send an attachment to you, you open it up, I can put a key logger on, I can steal your username and password, and then I just log in as you. By putting second and third factor authentications in place, which is nothing that has to do with my companies, but an important practice, uh, helps thwart the adversaries to another level. And uh, we need to put in better systems, especially interior server systems. Those controls have to get in place, and most of our critical infrastructure needs to deploy that. Some of that is in the recommendations, but the wide practice of it is almost never done. So we walk into customer after a customer, valid credentials are stolen, interior systems are compromised, and there's no level of authentication other than username and password and many times that is, you know, your son or daughter's name, and it isn't too hard to figure that one out. So a lot of uh, very easy ways to breach. Obviously, alternative mechanisms for uh, putting in uh, endpoint controls, uh, again, are, are key. There's some great technologies out there to do that, and probably some of the biggest recommendations I have, too, is to uh, do better hygiene and health checks. It's amazing uh, if you're an incident responder, uh, just what you see there in terms of uh, APTs that have been dormant inside the systems or active in the system for years. Some of the accounts have three, four, five years of the breach sustaining itself inside the architecture, which means the pen testing models and health check models aren't working. So how do we create a better health checking system to really help make these APTs get discovered inside the networks of our critical infrastructure? So very key. And probably the last piece I just tell you we need a much better understanding of what the adversaries are doing. We need a much better understanding of the risk that the critical infrastructure has. Many of the chief security officers that I talk to just don't know much about who it is that's attacking them and why, and what you're gonna do about it. So a little of this is education to helping them understand and map the risk, an enterprise risk management framework mapped to the adversary, understand what classes of employees are gonna be targeted, what classes of assets are gonna be hit, and building a defense architecture around that. That doesn't have to mean they have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars more to fix it. Basic improvements of the defense architecture aligned to where the risk is the greatest and aligned to where the people and assets are most deployed can have a huge impact on the uh, success that the adversaries are having. All right, with that, I'll pass it over to Jane. And, uh, Thank you. Great. Well, I can't think of anybody uh, to speak more cogently uh, to the threat environment and projections of where we're going to be going than Dave. So, so that was terrific. Um, how many of you in the audience are not technologists? Come on. Let me encourage you to raise your hand. Um, how many of you are? Who are the rest of you? Just curious. <laughs> Um, so, my name is Jane Lude. I'm not a technologist. Um, I feel that's important to, to say at the outset. Um, I'm the former Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security and had the opportunity over the course of the past four and a half or five years 
uh, to be at the center of this government's effort to establish a presence on cybersecurity and to establish cybersecurity as something we all need to think and worry about. I see some of my colleagues um, in that effort in the audience, Phil Reitinger and, and Mark Weatherford, uh, we bear the scars of trying to figure this out in a dynamic way, to try to build this plane while flying it. Um, and what I'm doing now is uh, deeply related to that, uh, that effort in Homeland Security. I'm running something called the Council on Cybersecurity with some of the finest technologists um, and individuals in this field. Uh, and what I thought I would do this morning is, or this afternoon is talk a little bit about what we're up to, what we're doing, what we're seeing uh, as we're doing it, and what we think is coming. Uh, I think those three, three things might be of interest here. First, I was very interested in the, the question Dave tossed over his shoulder, how many devices uh, do I, how many phones do I carry around? Well, between my husband, my youngest daughter, and I, just the three of us, we have five mobile phones, two desktop computers, three laptops, two iPads, one mini, and six e-readers. It's a lot. It's a lot. This past Thanksgiving, Thanksgivinga for some of us in the audience, um, our family came together and our, one of our daughters drove over from Germany, gabbing on her iPhone, um, tracking herself on her iPad while her son was streaming a movie in the car on the way through three countries to get to where we were in Belgium. Um, we Skyped with our daughter in Jordan um, and talked on the phone with our other daughter in Manhattan, at least we think she was in Manhattan. <laughs> That's what the phone number said, but there was really no telling where she was. She's in dance music, um, so we don't ask. But the point was, um, we're all of us online all the time, certainly all of us in this room. And so why was there a need to establish the Council on Cybersecurity? Quite frankly, because the technologists and the policymakers have not been speaking to each other coherently uh, up until very, very recently. And in fact, in part as a result of that, we haven't made progress in this country, or frankly around the world, in, in where we should, uh, the, to the extent that we should in cybersecurity at all. And so we created this council, which is a not-for-profit, independent, international expert reference point for what best practice ought to be in cybersecurity. And we're focused on identifying, validating, promoting, and sustaining that best practice over time keeping it up to date and applicable, not only for technologists, but for policymakers as well. We're working in three key areas, technology, manpower, and policy. In technology, our focus is all about the 20 critical controls. The Council on Cybersecurity is now the home to the 20 critical controls. Tony Sager, known to many of you in this room, who's the director of programs at the Council, has just convened two expert panels, one which will be a standing executive panel, to review the controls on an annual basis, we'll report out at RSA every year, beginning this coming RSA conference, uh, on the update of the controls. And the second panel is a panel on threats, looking at what we're seeing in the wild, we're seeing in industry, we're seeing across the board with respect to threats, and, and asking ourselves whether or not we have, we, do we have adequate controls for the threats we're facing? Uh, some may say we need a 21st control. Others may say that, you know, 20 is too big, we need to neck that down into four or five that can really do the job. And with respect to those four or five, um, this is, for me, one of the key messages of the immediate period and the coming period. We're not in any way, I mean, Dave talked about it um, and talks about it, uh, Jim does as well, others of you in this room, about cyber hygiene. Uh, from a policymaker's perspective, part of the problem has been that the dialogue that we're having with the technological experts has been focused on cyber couture, and we need ready to wear. We don't understand most of the time when technologists are speaking to us, we just want to know what are the things that we can do and the things that we should do first that will have the biggest effect in keeping our systems and our networks secure. We're not exactly sure what even that means, but we do know now that the threat is real, that it's getting worse, that our vulnerability is increasing, and that the status quo is no answer. Those were the same factors that drove the US government to get into this space in a very big way beginning in 2009, when we called out for the first time the mission of ensuring the cybersecurity of the nation's critical infrastructure. 
person most responsible for that is sitting in this room, Phil Reitinger came into my office when we were writing the QHSR, when we were finalizing that document, the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, and said, we cannot ensure a safe, secure, resilient place where the American way of life can thrive unless we call out cybersecurity as a core mission. And up until that point, we had talked about preventing terrorism, securing our borders, enforcing and administering our immigration laws, and building national resilience in the face of disaster and we added, because of the, the logic of Phil's argument, and not to say he wouldn't leave my office until I did, we added cybersecurity as a core mission for Homeland Security, and it has remained so ever since. And in part, you can trace the increasing awareness and activity on cybersecurity to, over the past four and a half or five years to the fact that Homeland Security began to get in the game in a very big way um, as the lead agency in the federal government for cybersecurity. And as we were doing that, we focused on what our mission would be. And we said we needed to protect .gov, we needed to do more in .gov to prevent bad things from happening and respond and mitigate rapidly when they did. And we also at that time began to focus on fundamentals and hygiene. What are the basic things we need to do and what are the things we need to do first to have biggest effect? So, so we have been, ever since that time, and certainly in the Council on Cybersecurity now, I'm focused, like a laser, on the top, uh, the top 20 critical controls, but really on the top four or five. The Australians have recently conducted a test where they had 1,200 machines in a network, and they ran, the, they ran up 1,700 pieces of, of unique, most common malware against them with no controls, one, two, three, four, and prevented what percent? What, what, what success rate do you think they had in preventing attacks? 100%. 100%. Now, they don't claim that the top four will prevent 100% of all, all attacks that you're facing, but the number's pretty high. And from a non-technologist and, and policy-making point of view, the number's high enough to be persuaded that these are the kinds of things that we should be doing. Um, we're persuaded that the threat is real again. We're persuaded that it's growing. We're persuaded that our vulnerabilities are increasing. I mean, when people ask me, what's the greatest threat that you see out there? Everybody wants me to say the Chinese or the Iranians or, you know, anonymous. And I always say, unpatched existing vulnerabilities that you leave unpatched, that's the greatest threat. We're not doing anything about it or we're not doing nearly enough. So one of the things that we're focused on in the Council is the 20 critical controls, are the four fundamentals of cyber hygiene. I tell non-technical audiences, this is the equivalent of brushing your teeth, flossing, and visiting the dentist twice a year. Now surprisingly, surprisingly, there are a number of people in the technological community that says there is no such thing as adequate hygiene. There's nothing you can possibly do to defend yourself unless it's tailor-made to you. That's why I call it cyber couture. Well, frankly, the policy, my, my, the policy community thinks that's nonsense. It's nonsense. There are fundamentals. We may not understand this field deeply to the level of technical expertise that many of you have in this room, but we understand complex organizations enough, and there are always a few fundamentals, a few sound practices that can, that can punch way above their weight in achieving the effect. And so we're pushing, I'm pushing the, four, the top four uh, of the 20 critical controls. We're also working on manpower because we don't think that the, the technology will be in the, entirely the answer here. Nobody does. How do we understand this field we're calling cybersecurity? A recent national, um, uh, a report of the National Academies, the National Research Council said, it's too soon to try and professionalize the field of cybersecurity. We should wait for things to stabilize. Really? Really? Have you talked to your doctor lately? Ask them how stable the field of medicine is. Sure, there are a lot of things that they've le learned over the course of thousands of years, but it's changing all the time. It's not too early to try and seek professional standards and a focus on what are the mission-critical cyber skills for security that we need. There are a lot of important positions in the IT, in your IT networks and in your systems and that operate and handle your information, but not all of them are security experts. And when it comes to cybersecurity expertise, 
how much of that expertise should non-cybersecurity experts, such as electrical engineers, for example, operating the grid, those in oil and gas, those with other, operating other complex SCADA systems, how much cybersecurity should they have baked into their professional preparation um, and be tested on and certified against standards that people recognize, acknowledge, and respect? And that's where we need to go, in our view, uh, in the area of, of manpower. On policy, the full range uh, of issues is open, ranging from everything from governance of the internet, which is a hot question among governments right now, um, down to what individual enterprises can do. What's, gonna, what's going to, where's the future going? Um, we all, you know, it's, it's, we're all as good enough to guess at that as anyone else. Uh, I agree with Dave's characterization of how the threat environment is going to unfold. I don't think the internet will look the way it does even two years from now. I think we'll see major structural changes uh, in the way it's administered and maintained. And we're already beginning to see uh, countries move in individual directions in that regard. Will we have the same kind of connectivity? Major applications already don't have that for those of you, those of us, I should say, who try to reconcile uh, iCal and Google Calendar uh, can attest. Really fix this, please, fix this. Um, so where else are we going? I think we're going to be able to judge the viability of an enterprise, the financial viability of an enterprise through looking at one thing, its cybersecurity posture. It will tell us how well they're protecting their IP, it will tell us how robust their systems are, and it will tell us how good they are in compliance with the regulatory and other regimes that they have to comply with only by looking at their cybersecurity posture. We're going to develop that model uh, in the council, um, and we're already having a lot of interest um, among enterprises in seeing how, because they believe that they can use that approach then not only to fix their cybersecurity, uh, but also to improve their business viability. Fundamentally, what I should say is that we learned this in Homeland Security in every aspect of what it is we did, not just cybersecurity, that the federal government cannot do all that needs doing here. Um, and so I differ a little bit from Dave and others in the room as I try not to use language from the national security or from the defense environment in this environment. Um, I don't think anyone who, I think only those who have teenage boys in their families will accept anything called a detonation chamber <laughs> in their systems at home. Um, but I, I think we, we uh, we're, he we're all headed in the right direction. No one's trying to get this wrong, uh, but it is going to take all of us working together. Um, will we be able to leave it to the market simply to handle our cybersecurity? No. We don't leave anything to the market by itself to handle. Is this so dangerous and is this so complex that only our government can do all that needs doing? That's also manifestly not true. So we need to collaborate together and we will need to find new models of sustained public-private partnership to address business viability, address privacy, and address the cybersecurity that we need, not in the future, but what that we need today. Thanks very much. Uh, great presentations by both our speakers. We have time for a couple of questions. Dave has a plane at three, and even I am getting nervous. But uh, so maybe you could start if you have questions for Dave. We'll start with them, and then have questions for Jane. If you have questions for both of them, we'll wing it. Uh, any questions? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, question. And could you uh, identify yourself, please? And uh, Mark Price, Stepco, and Johnson. I've got a question, I guess, for both Dave and. Jane, and it's about sort of reconciling what you all both talked about. Um, Dave focused on the very scary threat landscape, in particular the advanced threats, but um, Jane, you focused on basic hygiene, the 20 controls. So the question is, are the 20 controls going to be adapted, you know, neck down, expanded to incorporate protections against some of the things that Dave was talking about? Um, I'll just say quickly, absolutely. Um, the threat panel that we're convening is designed precisely to look at the things that Dave laid out, I think, really cogently. Um, you know, I was on the phone with Kaspersky Labs this morning, and um, they wanted to know if we were going to include um, evidence and data that they had had from uh, nation state intrusions that they're picking up um, to see whether or not the controls would work against them. So, I mean, there's a pretty, this is a, this is a new landscape uh, that we're in right now. 
One thing I'd just add on is uh, I vehemently agreed with what Jane was saying earlier. It's amazing what just good hygiene can do. Um, you find so many systems where the vulnerability has been known for a long period of time, yet it was unpatched. It, it just, just trying to get basic rigor around just improving what we do know about you know, can, can really dramatically improve. Are we gonna be able to protect ourselves against advanced nation state attacks? Maybe not, but there is a lot of hacktivism that can be stopped just from a lot of controls that basic hygiene can improve upon, so. Uh, others? Go ahead, please. My name is Frank Barone, I'm a private investor and I'm partly hybrid technologist and hybrid non-technologist, so I fit your description. A couple things that I heard today, which I was very encouraged about. Certainly delighted to see that there are tools that are skilled and capable of identifying what's happening. That seems to me like a pretty strong national asset. And I think I heard you say that the Australians have some kind of a test environment where they ran 100 tests against 100 test cases. So I guess I ask the question is, do we have a national policy on test beds for cyber beds? We, we do that for everything. We do it on airplanes, we do it on tanks, we do it on cars. It would seem to me that you've got the tools. Somebody, the Australians is a case, built a test bed of some kind and wrung out a significant amount of information. So it sounds to me like it's time to put the policy on the back burner, move the tools to the front, and turn up the gain on the test beds. Does that make sense? No, no, it makes perfect sense to me. I'm, I'm not, I've been out of government five months, I'm not current. Um, there, are, there are cyber ranges that exist. There are a number of tests and tools that are run. Have we run our own comprehensive test like the Australians to validate the controls? No. Would we like to do it? Yes. That's something we're gonna pursue. Is it government policy yet? Um, uh, not to my knowledge. I have to say, I, I kind of like the name Detonation Chamber, but then I, 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 I do have teenage boys and they do play Call of Duty, so. <laughs> Other questions here, we got any? A torture chamber, yeah. <laughs> I have one, I'm gonna ask it, and this will be the last question then, which is, um, one of the things that I'm interested in, and in, in particularly if you looked at uh, Dave's remarks the last time when we had Chris Inglis there, it looks to me, and some of the other work we've seen, there's been articles in the Times, there's been the uh, Verizon uh, report. What do you think the future is for the AV industry, AVG industry, AV industry, pardon me? What the technologies that we had developed convincingly don't seem to work as well. What's the future industry gonna look like when it comes to? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, the first thing I would probably tell you is there, there's obviously a place for antivirus, I think, for a long time to come. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, is it the exclusive place of detection engines? I don't think so. And I think that's what we're, we're suffering a little bit from today, is when you look at the security industry, uh, we, we're spending probably over $30 billion globally on security today, when you look at the industry. And when you look at the uh, detection engine, itself, it represents tens of billions of dollars, 10 to 20 billion of that comes from the antivirus vendors and the antivirus model. So you almost have a monopolization that's occurred on the engine itself, which is, which is interesting because that engine, while having a very wonderful place in the world for stopping a lot of the controls and, and, and attacks that are happening, can't stop a lot of these advanced attacks. So what do we need to do? Complement it. We can't have just one. Our defense in depth model has to evolve from a single detection technology to multiple detection methodologies. And I think that's just a little of the learning that I continue to see is we have to involve in, in recommending controls, improving those controls to say, hey, antivirus is great. There is a whole lot of benefit from that that can happen. Because once the attack is known, the controls can work. But if you don't know about the attack, and the attacks are sophisticated and advanced, and they're what they call zero-day type of attacks, well, what detection methodology do we have for that? And so the complementary nature of the old and the new a little bit, or the evolving and the new, is probably what we have to put in place. And the defense in depth has to evolve to have multiple detection capabilities. So at least my view on that. And by the way, in two years from now, three years from now, it might be another one. But if we can't evolve the controls to have multiple ones, 
we're going to miss out on whatever nation state or hacktivist group or whatever it might be who's evolving very quickly too. So keep the policy up, keep the controls up, keep the methodologies up, and we'll, we'll be much closer to where the adversary are than we are right now. With that, please join me in thanking our two speakers. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Are you going to stick around? Or? Okay, great. Um, if I could ask the panelists to come up and if we could get the nameplates for them. Uh, huh? I don't care, no. One of the things that was uh, funny uh, about the uh, RSVP list is there were so many people who um, are experts in the audience that I kept saying to them, well, if you want to be on the panel, let me know. Uh, none of them did, but I think it will lead to a robust uh, Q&A period. Hi, Adam. I, I promised Bob that we'd save him a sandwich. He drove in nobly from BWI and got here on time. Thank you. So let me uh, quickly introduce the panelists. Uh, we have a great team here. Um, topic for today is really to discuss, in light of the keynote remarks, um, what we think the framework is going to do, where we think it's going to go, what might need to you know, be a path for evolution on it. I'll just introduce them briefly. Um, we'll have their bios on our website. We have a website with the uh, white paper, podcasts, interviews with people that you'll be able to find, I hope, uh, at CSIS.org. Yeah. Um, first, uh, Adam Sedgwick, uh, Senior Information Technology Policy Advisor at NIST. Um, many of you know Adam from his uh, time on the Hill. He's really the guy I think of as the, uh, the uh, stucky on the framework and has done uh, most of the work in pushing it forward, along with all his colleagues, but uh, really grateful that he could be here. Uh, Angela McKay, uh, Principal Security Strategist, Global Secu Security Strategy and Diplomacy at Microsoft, uh, someone we've had speak many times here before at CSIS, a, a real expert in the field. Uh, Craig Rosen, the Chief Information Security Officer at FireEye, one of the people who's helped build this company and understands the threat in a, in a, a, a depth that most of us don't share. Um, Paul Kurtz, many of you know, a long career. The parts that were involved with me you could call checkered, but a long career in cybersecurity, dating really back to the, the Clinton administration, so one of the national treasures here, now the Chief Strategy Officer at CyberPoint International, and uh, a lot of experience both here and overseas. Uh, last but not least, Bob Butler, who is one of the founding fathers in the field, wouldn't you say? I don't know. He may not like that, but someone who has uh, commanded respect, who comes out of uh, DOD, who initiated a lot of the policies that uh, began our efforts to improve national cybersecurity. And so we're really grateful. To, and who also just flew in, what, an hour and a half ago? Landed at 11, so really appreciate the fact that you could be here. Um, I'm going to start with a few questions for the panelists, um, then we'll open it up to the floor. This is supposed to be interactive and exchange, so think about the framework, think about what you want to know, think about the, the threats that are looking up. Maybe what I'll do is I'll start with Adam and say if you could give us a, a little bit of an update on where the framework is, where you think it's going to go, um, how happy you are with the process. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, I wonder if I should start with that last question, but I'll get to it at the end. Um, I, I like the title of this, uh, of this event because it, it does give us me a chance to make a pitch, which is, um, you know, we are in a period now where um, we have a preliminary framework, as was called for in the executive order. Um, and then we're in the period where we have this, we're in this four-month period where we're, we're able to take that and uh, think about how we need to improve it. So um, the, RF, the, the, the framework itself has been posted since the end of October. We missed our deadline due to the shutdown, which causes a lot of angst for some of us. Um, but we, and we, we commenced a 45-day comment period that, it, that expires um, a week from Friday. So Friday the 13th, it also gives me a good out on any tough questions I have now. I can just say I look forward to seeing your submission so we can make that change. 
Um, in terms of what we're doing while that's going on, I mean, one thing I would point people to is if, if you look at the process that we created under the exec executive order um, when we got this assignment back in February, um, it was really to, to engage with as broad a, a community, the stakeholders, the owners and operators uh, of critical infrastructure, the people providing the services and, and the policymakers, other government agencies. And we did it through a series of uh, open discussions, open forums. Um, we had workshops throughout the country. Um, and you know, basically in every stage, we, we would pose these sort of difficult questions, starting with the request for information. And then, and then kind of this role was really just to provide that structure um, and the analysis so that, that people can have these conversations. And I think one of the things that was unique about it was having folks um, having that diverse a community in the same room. You would have, uh, uh, at, at the workshops, you'd have large multinational corporations sitting next to small water utilities, um, sitting next to foreign governments. It was, and, and all with the effort of achieving that same goal. And our effort, and one of the things we have tried to do throughout the process is be as open and transparent as possible so people understand the decisions that are getting made. Um, and in that context, you know, one of the things that we've been doing that I can say, you know, we, we, we posted out just yesterday, um, as we've done throughout the process, kind of a summary of the workshops, um, which, are, which are true working sessions. They'll be short plenaries and then um, we'll break into groups. Um, so, you know, we look, for, uh, look forward to the discussion, look forward to thinking about ways to improve. Um, our time frame is to get the comments in by the 13th. We only have a handful now, but that's pretty common. I expect them all to come in um, Thursday and Friday at 4.58, if uh, history <laughs> has anything to say about it. Um, and then, you know, what we will do is, uh, you know, we, we hope that people will be looking over our shoulder and, and doing their own analysis of the comments and helping, helping us determine um, what, where the consensus is, where, where are the things, elements we need to pull in. Um, and then, you know, one of the, one of the other things that, that we're thinking about doing is, uh, you know, in February when this is due, when the year under the executive order is up, um, we also intend to kind of to report out a, uh, a roadmap for future action. You know, the, the framework in, in its simplest way is to look at, you know, the existing capabilities to elevate the use of those that we know to be effective. But then that third piece of it is, is vitally important, and that's thinking about what are the next things that we need to work on? How do we... Um, get these capabilities into the hands of the people that really need them. So uh, that's going to be our focus um, post-February, and, and I think it's really important. Um, and, and that's part of the document now. We have a whole areas for improvement section talking about these um, advanced elements. So I really do, as well as looking at the, the document itself, I really do invite the people in this room to look at that section and think about how we need to improve and how we should structure that work over the next years. Thank you, Adam. Let me uh, turn to the panel now, and maybe we could uh, start with a question that builds on the keynotes and just go down the row starting with Bob. But um, we heard a lot about advanced threats and their success rate, which is uh, incredibly high. How do you think the advanced threat is going to evolve in the next few years? What do you look forward? If we assume it's a dynamic opponent, they're going to react, they're going to respond. What will that look like? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, Jim, my, my sense here is uh, you have to take it from the perspective of what foreign intelligence services are doing and what you're seeing today in terms of um, convergence. Um, so people taking advantage of vulnerabilities as they exist today, whether they're zero days or what have you, but also looking at the convergence of insider threat, um, cover company access with remote network access, and how that plays together in a, in, in a, collusive, in a, in a way of collusion. Um, so, if you think about where we are today, whether you look at the recent, you know, hijacking uh, over at Facebook or any of the things that have recently happened, um, you're seeing, I think, uh, uh, advancements and appropriations of techniques against botnets and using botnets differently. Um, you're seeing ways that we can weaponize things a little bit differently. And I think that will continue to happen. I think the real uh, dangerous part of this is the collaboration and collusion of um, uh, sophisticated actors working uh, with with others that may not have as much care and are actually out for other motives. I think the vectors continue to evolve with regards to um, to the threat itself. I see it in the job that I have uh, at I.O. as a, a global data center company. Um, 
you know, we, we do see regularly um, ways uh, that people are now increasing not only in terms of intensity of attacks with the state distributed denial of service, working with financial services, but uh, creative ways of stealing credentials, um, looking at um, not just classically PII, uh, you know, stealth, and then, um, and then also looking at IP theft, but looking at those together and actually building campaigns, you know, really what we talk about with an advanced persistent threat. Um, I also see that, um, you know, as time goes on in the world that I live in, we are a DHS CIKR asset. We have critical infrastructure that's built on industrial control systems, and so I don't lose sight of, you know, what has happened with Stuxnet and others. And uh, we still have tremendous challenges there. And if, you know, if I'm thinking for, as a, a foreign intelligence service or any uh, nasty type of uh, um, actor that might want to try to exploit, um, certainly our industrial control system base, our operational technology that drives energy up into the IT stack is, is still very vulnerable. Um, so I think there's still a lot of vectors out there, and as we remediate within uh, the space that we're in today, and uh, again, my hat's off to Alex and the NIST team for what they have put together at this point, I think we have to continue to stay focused on we're living and continuing to live in a, in a greater um, interconnected world that creates opportunities and threats, and the threat continues to advance. And so, um, you know, I think a document like the framework is a good starting point, but it needs to be a threat-driven document. It needs to be a document that kind of looks out forward into the world of interconnectedness and what that means for us as we kind of move forward, both in national security and economic competitiveness. Great. So um, before FIRE, I also spent about six years in critical infrastructure, so there's a long list in my head of, um, you know, possibilities here to discuss, but I'll pick two. Um, starting with kind of the distributed nature of what's happening out there. Um, you know, I do remember when a website was a server. Um, when you look around now, a website's a conglomeration of multiple sites, snippets of code. Um, it's incredibly complex. Uh, so what I think we're going to see is, is kind of preying on that complexity, and we've seen it already, right? We've seen, um, you know, things like watering hole attacks and luring you to one site or infecting a third party of a third party of a third party who's a snippet of your website who lives in another data center. And so it's incredibly complex and it's easy to prey on that complexity. So I think that whole distributed model of our assets being out there and then you couple that with mobile and it gets exponentially complex, right? Um, Jane talked about the six devices alone in her home. Um, so, you know, that's one. I think that distributed model and the mobile side and the complexity is one. And then the second one is, you know, um, on the supply chain side of the house. Um, and you know, part of this, I draw my critical infrastructure experience, but it's pretty much everywhere, right? I'm concerned about um, things like firmware, embedded systems. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think what we're gonna see is we're gonna see these threats kind of go lower into the stack, right? Um, so that they're persistent and they're there all the time. So I think that those are the two that I pick uh, out of a long list of possibilities, um, but those are the two on top of mind right now for me. So I guess what I would say here is, you know, some things are going to stay the same and some things are going to change over time. We'll start with the easiest of the stay the same. Um, the layer eight in the system, in other words, all of us, the user and the attacks, spear phishing attacks on users, we have not been able to address that challenge historically, and I think that's going to continue to be a challenge over time. And, and some of the things that Jane was talking about in, in workforce education are going to be important there, but that's always going to be there. Um, also, I believe that this credential, uh, credential theft and credential harvesting will continue. Uh, one of the things that we've seen at Microsoft is in some of the more determined and persistent attacks, there is um, a technique called pass the hash that is used quite frequently. And what that does is it basically gets a set of credentials and logins and then can use that to either move laterally through the system or escalate privileges in the system. And that's a great way to move around inside of the network in order to find things that may be of more interest. And then building on the points actually that were just said by Craig, when we think about things that are gonna be new, um, I'm gonna highlight two. 
Uh, first, I think, is the um, effects that we're going to see in small and mid-sized businesses. And so, Craig, you kind of hit on a supply chain. So yeah. sometimes people just think about the supply chain side as being, you know, malware, malicious malware inside of a product or service, and that's one angle. But another angle I think we will see is the partnership side of the supply chain attacks. Yeah. So moving from small and mid-sized businesses that don't have necessarily the resources or capabilities to secure themselves adequately that our partners are either brought into other organizations through mergers and acquisitions. And then last but certainly not least, um, as we all move to greater encryption because of concerns that we hear about in the news, what I also think that we'll see is a move towards greater insider threat. Because as we start to make these systems a little bit more secure and use encryption, people are still going to want to access the system. So we're going to have to watch out for that human side inside of the organizations as well. Thank you, Angela. That was very diplomatically put about events in the news. So, uh, uh, Paul. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, just really to, to add on what others uh, have said. Uh, first point that I would, I would note, uh, most of you or many of you may be aware of the Defense Science Board report that came out earlier this year. It has an excellent breakdown of classification of the threat actors uh, from those who are relying on existing exploits that exist out there today to those who are um, able to develop their own tools and finally to those who actually can manipulate the supply chain. And I, I think that was the first time I actually saw a public useful template of breaking down who the bad guys are. But problematically, just the same, it notes that we can have um, the bad actors, as in states or foreign intelligence organizations, use those less sophisticated capabilities in order to achieve their ends. Uh, and that brings me to what I think the, the, the three um, uh, developments we might see over the, over the coming uh, uh, years. Number one, organizationally, how the bad guys operate. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of hackers for hire. I'm not talking about anonymous. I'm talking about uh, small, agile groups operating uh, well below the radar screen that are hired by others, whether they be foreign intel organizations, whether they be nation states, whether they be terrorist organizations, uh, I think we're going to see those kind of cells and units uh, form up and, and operate more actively. Um, in Bruce Willis's uh, What Is It Live Free or Die Hard, which came out in 2007, which is actually based on an article written in 1997, an article in, in, in Wired uh, talked about the you know, terrorists, if you using, um, using the networks to cause a, uh, uh, a financial crash. Uh, uh, around the world and across the country. And I, unfortunately, I think organizationally, the way that the actors operate is, is going to change before us, and it's going to pose a lot of problems for people. The second uh, issue I note is the speed of attack. Um, and this is, if you will, good news, bad, no bad news story. I think there are a lot of companies, FireEye and others, uh, my company, CyberPoint, is working on capabilities as well to automate um, reverse engineering uh, of malware. Uh, and that would really help the good guys better defend networks. Uh, we can understand capabilities far more rapidly, don't need necessarily all the human talent uh, that we have to throw against the problem now to understand what really may be happening. Well, we have to also remember that the bad guys will get a hold of that stuff too. And they will use it uh, to come against us at a much more rapid uh, pace than we have, uh, we have even currently see uh, as hard as that may or difficult as that may be uh, to believe. And the third evolution that I would highlight um, is uh, attacking the cloud. I think this is an enormous uh, problem. I just came from the Cloud Security Alliance Congress uh, down in Orlando. And uh, when we look at critical infrastructure, and I know we talk about IT being important and as one in the infrastructure, but the cloud, in particular, a small number of players in the cloud will have, uh, will be, if you will, the critical infrastructure because they will support everyone whether we know it or not. And that's where I think where NIST work and, and the guidance you're putting together I, is, is, is useful, but will also be incredibly challenged uh, because the cloud infrastructure is in, 
incredibly complex that is not easily um, defended. I think we have a very long way to go in, in that case. We know that the bad guys are using the cloud now to attack others. Uh, and the White House has picked that up and through the banking attacks to the Nile service attacks that have taken place over the past year. But I also think we need to look out and how the cloud itself is going to be attacked. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have much to add to that. I don't think I could do a better job than these four, actually, in the space a little more closely. But, you know, I, I would say that it, it does echo the things that we've heard about, um, you know, throughout our process about sort of the, the complexity that, that develops through the increased flexibility and the new technologies that come in, um, and, and as well as the, the, the threat evolving. And, and I think, you know, in terms of how policymakers think about these things, it's really important to, to think about how do we develop the solutions and the policies that are really focused on those outcomes um, so that, you know, we maintain that level of flexibility to allow for that, those change, changing landscapes, I think is really critically important for the framework, but also all of our work going forward. Great. Thank you. Um, let me start again. I'll start with Bob and we'll go down the row. Uh, one of the things that would be interesting to think about in light of what you've all been saying is how does the creation of this kind of framework, good or bad for cybersecurity, how does it change the landscape for policy and legislation? What is it we're gonna to have to do differently now? Um, I was gonna ask about companies as well, but let's do policy and legislation first. We have something now that we can hold things up to. What is it, what's different? Yeah, I think this is, um, I mean, we have the basis, as you said, Jim, for, for now moving forward. I remember Phil and I working a few years back on uh, trying to get at this idea of now, how do you enforce it, right? What, what's the, what, what are the carrots and the sticks that make this all work? And, uh, you know, I give credit to Phil and the DHS team and a lot of folks that were working in that space at the time with, you know, finding ways through, um, through creative means not to impose regulation, but to encourage people uh, to raise the bar. Um, you look at champions within sectors um, that can help in that capacity, especially when you link it with, uh, you know, the issue that we were talking about with supply chain. We have to take advantage of champions in these sectors to help us strengthen the overall sector. So in the financial services world, I mean, the Goldman's, the J.P. Morgan's of the world, we need to, th we need to find ways to help them help smaller institutions, credit unions, and state banks and things like that. Um, I think uh, regulation is an anathema. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a hard, it's hard to impose, but I think, uh, you know, as we saw in DOD, um, we had to impose rule sets to ensure national security, whether it was, uh, you know, nuclear C2 was easy, it was a closed network, um, but missile defense, thin line force projection, there are certain things that we had to impose within the DFARS, you know, the Defense Federal Acquisition Rules to make those happen. Um, and, you know, we, I think we built an education campaign. Um, we, we then worked uh, through different approaches, which led to information sharing arrangements, which we continue to enhance. Um, and I think that's all part of what we're gonna have to do. In terms of specific legislation, I think the basis um, the, for what we need to do is, is on the table. I really think we, we need to now take that and uh, say, hey, we've got this framework, right? So this, so legislators and policymakers, you can understand how this links together. Um, I would tell you that I think there is, even though the, the NIST framework, Adam, refers to business risk and tolerance processes and other documents, I would bring more of that out because I think that's going to that's going to have to be a part of the education campaign in incentivizing this. You know, again, working where I work reporting to boards and working with other boards, um, just using a framework of, you know, identify, protect, detect, um, needs to be translated into business objectives and risk, you know. And so if, if a company has objectives of international market expansion or they're being driven into certain other kinds of compliance regimes based on industry, this has to dovetail with that. And there's got to be a, a way of characterizing um, risk tolerance in that space as we go forward in time. So I think those are uh, some of the things that I would lean towards, again, incentivizing. 
as opposed to regulating finding champions that actually in a sense highly encourage and actually help folks i mean work with some companies today that have actually adopted that role quite well and i watch in their extended enterprise where they're providing software education training as well as inspections down chain to ensure that these kinds of standards are continually implemented one last point within the spaces and i think adam brought this up this is not a static framework again based on a threat driven model best practices have to become standards and we have to continue that cycle continuously so one of the things that um, caught me right away and i can talk a little bit about the risk side of it um, is you know looking at this framework we have the right building blocks um, I would like to, to see an expansion in the risk management areas as well, but I think it's a great start. One of the things that's really powerful in this framework is, is that it actually blends the concepts of risk management of controls and safeguards yes. and maturity levels together. Now, it just, you know, it, it touches on maturity by describing maturity, um, you know, and we may touch on this later, but I'd like to see more of a linkage between the actual maturity models and the risks. So what's gonna incentivize people to get to a certain level um, and for it to really kind of draw that out a lot more. Um, but I really think that for the first time, it's really powerful to see these concepts working together with the right building blocks in place. And I think we've got you know some, some work to do. My hat is off the NIST. I've worked with NIST before. Um, you know, on, on some areas and, you know, I know it's a complex process and you can't make everybody happy, um, you know, at the end of the day. But one of the things that I think we really can do is focus more on this risk management area and look at the different levels of maturity so that an organization can say, hey, there's a, you know, there's a tier four organization. What are the things that I can do to put into place that are going to get me to that level? Um, and, you know, if we kind of take a look at it from that perspective, you know, I think we'll see more of that behavior. And risk management you know, um, itself is a process that should be measured, right? And there are models out there, the electric sector, I, I spent a lot of time in that area. Um, you know, they've got models, and I'll never get the acronym right, but it's the E2CMM, C2, yeah, we've never been able to get that right. But those models that are out there that really sort of describe what it looks like to be. And um, so I think that, you know, having those practices documented and spending time, and the framework does reference Right, mm -hmm. you know, other other um, documents that you would want to look at mm -hmm. to leverage for risk management. Um, you know, but I've also seen, you know, you know, playing the role of the CISO. The first thing you want to do is grab that one document, and that's what you want to follow. And you're going to flip to where it says, "Tell me what I need to do," and you're going to try to do it. And so, you know, what we'd like to do is 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 be able to highlight those more and more strongly. Be able to get companies and organizations to reference those documents or use them so that they can build in those levels of maturity. Um, those are my thoughts. Great, thank you. Yep. Angela. So when I think about how the framework and maybe the EO process is gonna affect the policy landscape, <clears throat> I'm gonna think about it at three levels. First at the corporate level, the domestic level, and then at the international level. From a corporate perspective, I think that this is driving a conversation and we're hearing it from our customers um, that we haven't had before. So while it is not yet into adoption and implementation, which I know are controversial in terms of the ways that it will happen, there's already a conversation occurring in the CSOs and with the board that I think has not been occurring before. We're hearing these requests from our customer. And so that's, I think, one indication of a positive effect. From a domestic policy perspective, you know, a long, I've been doing this a really long time, and I think forever people have been saying, well, you know, what are the things we should do for hygiene? And um, I try and avoid that word hygiene sometimes, but I said, you know, there are a set of things that should be generally done by everyone across the board. And there hadn't yet been anywhere that I had seen internationally a place that was security outcome focused, not control focused, but security outcome focused that said, these are generally the things that people should be doing to improve security. And so I think, you know, that is a data point and a touchstone that didn't exist in the ecosystem before. Um, and that provides also data when we think about how it gets adopted, about what levers will work and not work. So here in the United States, the approach that has been taken is fairly lightweight. I call it a turn the dial approach. 
However, if we don't actually see demonstrable change resulting from a voluntary adoption, I think that then provides a basis for what we see happening in other places around the world, which is a more regulatory approach. And so it's gonna give some data about how far can the market take us in different places and where there may still be a delta and what those different places are to address that. And then lastly, I did start to mention the international, but I think a lot of people in the world, whether they look to emulate or not emulate US policy, are looking to see how this works. And they're going to use it to shape their policies, whether it's, again, follow or not follow. And so I think, again, we have a real opportunity and a real impetus here to work very vigorously, particularly on the incentive side and voluntary adoption, to see how far we can go. And that's how I think that the framework has affected the policy landscape generally. Maybe one last point on domestic, which is um, I do think that there's going to continue to be various different initiatives from a Hill perspective, whether it's around information sharing or the Section 10 regulatory review that is called out in the EO. Those things are going to be moving forward and again, leveraging the data that is provided, hopefully through voluntary implementation. Thank you, Paul. Uh, let me roll back. There was a question uh, after Jane and uh, Dave spoke about you know, testing and how important testing might be uh, to help improve systems. And there was a question about, well, maybe that, that ought to be a policy. And I really cringe when I hear uh, government talk or government potentially take on those ideas and say, well, we need a policy. Everybody's got a pen test now. We, we, need, you know, we need a policy around um, having a, uh, a test grid of some type or, or a cyber range of some type. Some type. I say that as a marker as to how I look at the framework. I think, I think the framework, in fact, does change the landscape. It provides the template, uh, the framework that we've all been missing for the past 15 years. But now here's the danger. We have to encourage our policymakers uh, to resist enshrining it in law and regulation. Uh, properly, I think the executive order allows for at least some period of time for implementation of the framework and looking at adoption. But, and that is, you know, for uh, the private sector to get up to speed on it uh, in, in adoption. But I would argue, looking at the framework, especially um, uh, the five function areas and the tier areas, the four tier, area, tier areas, let the private sector also respond in trying to develop the tools and methodologies against that and to automate it, to streamline it, to develop those dashboards for senior de decision makers, for operators, on, on through the stack, up and down. So I, 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 it's, a, it's a very narrow path that we need to seek to walk, and it's gonna, if there, I was going to encourage government to do anything in this space, it would be continue to fund the de development and evolution of the framework. Don't cut the budget increase the budget, allow, allow the government to market it, to conduct, conduct the outreach at the other end. You've done all the, uh, uh, the round tables and the, um, uh, the meetings around the country you've taken. Well, now be able to take it back out on the road and talk about it and get people to adopt it and also allow innovators and entrepreneurs to develop against it. Um, that would be uh, far better than uh, seeing Congress or seeing the executive branch uh, rushed, uh, rushed to uh, adopt it. Because I think that uh, you know, rushing prematurely, uh, we could all uh, live to regret. The other big portion piece I would highlight here is the framework, as much as I like it, is what I would call the, in the good enough category. It, it helps 90% or 95% of the enterprises that are out there. That allows people to use the current framework and not just wait for the next version to come out. And, that, and that's something we want to be very open and transparent about. Uh, and also with the goal to eventually, you know, move this actual process out to industry entirely um, and, and to allow NIST to get out of the framework development business and, and, and go back to our role with supporting it through R&D and our work with the standards bodies. So those are all parts of the conversation that we come back to, uh, with, that we've had throughout this process, but we really uh, have a lot more vigorously uh, starting next year. Uh, Craig and then I'll go ahead, Craig. So um, I think that's a great question. Um, 
You know, I think uh, if we're going to beta test it, we ought to be very uh, selective in how we do that. And I'm gonna probably sound like a broken record here on the maturity side, and you know, but I'd love to pick a few different organizations, you know, some that are in implementation tier one through four, and run them through the rigor um, of, of this beta test. And I would say that we would also need to have some solid deliverables out of those beta tests. And I guess some of my fears here are that the organization with this framework is gonna to have to develop profiles, right? So they're gonna to have to actually go through a process to develop those profiles. So my fear is that they're gonna grab the framework and stick with the core profile and come out, you know, if we just do a beta test that's, here you go, does this work in your organization, and kind of get the bare minimum. So that's my concern, and that's why coming back to this, you know, how do we deal with these sophisticated issues, and how do we actually measure whether or not it's successful as a result of a beta test? Is it development of one profile, two, ten, five? Um, you know, I've seen some, some um, success in this area um, on the electric side with, uh, there, there's a grant, um, an, an organization called ASAP SG, which advanced security and acceler, it was advanced security and acceleration profile for smart grid. And they developed these things called security profiles, right? And I thought that was a great model for what needs to be the output of this process. And they were very specific and they talked about the systems and that's a lot of work, right? So, um, you know, you know, that work was, was done and I think that Again, going back to this beta test, we have to be very clear on what are the results and what are we expecting out of that beta test and what does it look like on the other side so that we can then feed back into the model and say, hey, this is working or it's not working. Just a, just a thought building on your, on your question. I mean, DHS has a process um, that's enabled through some tech experts out of Carnegie Mellon and others called a DHS Cyber Resiliency Review. Uh, there are many critical infrastructure companies that have voluntarily participated in that. Uh, an option could be, I mean, there might be other venues to, to link these two ideas together, right? So um, if you come at the cyber resiliency reviews that take place today, really focus on some of the basics that you see in this, uh, this continuum that, you know, we talk about in the document, the framework document, builds into business continuity and resilience as a broader concept. But it's a self-evaluation uh, that can then be used by that company. It's, it's confidential. But it's a good way, I think, uh, based on some sampling of different industries within sectors to kind of get a sense of whether it's, you know, whether it's helpful, what's the value add over time. Paul, you wanted to? Yeah, I, I may be jumping to a conclusion with your, with your question about beta tests, but when you say beta tests, it implies that in the end you're going to ultimately um, advocate the formal application of the framework. And I think we ought to really resist any sort of discussion that it is a beta test meant uh, toward that end or a, a series of beta tests. Um, I think I would rather see for um, advocacy around awareness and help with adoption of the framework, and if you will, let a, uh, let a thousand flowers bloom, so to speak, to see what it looks like. I also think, uh, to be the skunk at the garden party, or just to call it out, um, government is not exactly seen as the white knight right now. Uh, the willingness of the private sector to cooperate with the government in the sense of an application of a beta test in this space may well be limited. Uh, and that could be limited for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, for their current market share, for their desire to gain um, uh, additional market share overseas, all of which have taken a significant hit in the wake of, of Snowden. Uh, I'm not seeking to fault government activities here, but there is a dose of reality of how much government can hope to do in this space. And so if government can, if you will, encourage the adoption, facilitate the adoption in organizations like Jane's, uh, allowing them to succeed uh, and allowing the private sector to develop new capabilities uh, and programs against the framework that will help it is a far more constructive way to go in my mind then government starting to push and advocate for beta tests on the part of the private sector. 
I'm, I'm going to, we have a couple questions on the audience, but I'm going to lay down a marker for a question I hope we can come back to because it's come up a couple times. Um, a couple, about a year ago, we had a private meeting here. Some of you were here with uh, people to talk about uh, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and CISPA. And the privacy guys were saying, you know, we, they agree we need to amend these things and we need to do something. And uh, somebody uh, asked them, well, how long do you think that will take? And, and uh, they said, well, it'll take uh, two or three years, right, to, to change the legislation. Um, and that's probably an optimistic estimate. Uh, and the, the person in the, who, who was asking the question said, well, you clearly don't share the same sense of urgency that, that others of us have regarding this problem. And um, last week I was talking to a friend who'd uh, been in the White House in the first administration. We were laughing about the fact that we had both seen the Patriot Act in uh, 1997, 1998. And the folks who had written the Patriot Act, or the bits of it, uh, said, and you, you know, well, we're just waiting for the politically right circumstances to deploy it, and then we know. And so what I've been thinking about is, we're cruising along here like we have a lot of time. We've always been wrong when we've said the threat is coming really fast. But we all know, too, that the day after something bad happens, and we come really close to it in the last year, uh, there will be a rush to judgment and a rush to legislation. So maybe when we come back towards the end, I can ask the panelists about how do you balance the go slow experiment, all this other happy stuff, with the fact that we could wake up tomorrow and be whacked over the head, right? But while they're thinking, uh, I saw a couple hands out there. Go ahead, please. Uh, we'll get that one. Please identify yourself, so and we'll get Andy. Thank you. Kevin Umar with the Perry Center at uh, National Defense University. Following up on something that, that Paul said and really linking with uh, James's comments, how do you positively incentivize on the, from the policy government side adoption of frameworks uh, that will improve the overall cybersecurity of the country um, in a positive manner? I mean, regulations can be seen as negative and impose costs, but how do you positively incentivize that in ways that would be acceptable to the private sector? Sure. Yeah, actually, this is where I think the, the framework can really be, um, if you can, t this is, let me see if I can spit this out. If you can take the framework and the functions, the five key functions outlined in the framework, and um, the, uh, the, four, uh, the four levels of um, maturity, if you, and you apply um, uh, a set of controls or uh, a compilation of set of controls along the lines of the 20 critical controls, in a continuous monitoring environment. Then you ultimately enable uh, the insurance industry to start writing down risk and to start writing insurance uh, associated with the risk. That is a very positive uh, uh, w way for us to go, which is, is not regulation. It's not forced adoption. It will help raise, uh, raise the overall water uh, mark on the level of security we have. Uh, distribute the risk uh, more evenly. The, what, what the framework does is at least give us what appears to be a common template across uh, the private sector, which, we, which has been absent. Now, I think this is where I advocate for the private sector being able to do more, because I think the private sector can de begin to develop the tools that will ultimately allow the insurance industry to get the data they need so the actuarial folks, the really green eye shade people, the computer people can actually do their business of understanding uh, risk in the space. That's, it's, this, the, 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 the framework should be seen as an enabler, uh, not as an end in itself. Um, so I think about how it can, uh, the incentives on the market side, maybe from both the demand side and from the supply side. And when I looked at the uh, list of incentives that came out of the White House, I think about it as a little bit more focused on the demand side. And some of those things really are going to matter if they can come to bear. Um, and, and anyone who was at the NIST workshop in one of the voluntary program um, meetings, I said something about I think we need to, to deal with some pragmatism that um, the incentives that have laid, been laid out are going to take time 
to be manifest. And so there's a little bit of time here where there isn't a huge amount of incentives on the table, and we have to kind of live with that reality. But when I think about prioritizing some of the ones that would help on the demand side of this, um, obviously government procurement is going to be one of the ones that could have a significant pull. And also, depending on how the government procurement is done, it could also have a pull down the supply chain. So there are those people who do vend directly with the government, but if they require it th from their supply chain, you ha also have that market pull. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things for large multinationals like Microsoft is going to be actually having the U.S. government and industry work on harmonization and getting similar things to the framework done in other places around the world. So for getting the U.S. government and U.S. industry working along with our colleagues in the EU who are dealing with the NIST directive, the more we can get these things more closely harmonized, that's a huge incentive for industry because it creates predictability on a much larger basis. Um, obviously, the one that I you know, don't hold out a lot of hopes for right now is liability protection is very important to a lot of folks in industry. <clears throat> Um, and so those are the kind of demand side. And then I'd like to hit the things that Paul talked about earlier, which is the supply side. As we start to see the conversations move towards how do I adopt or implement the framework, <clears throat> there is a supply side that will come out of the ICT industry that says, you know, we don't have enough people. No matter where you're at in the world, there are not enough people. We're going to draw a line and say, this is, these are the security outcomes you need to get to. But unfortunately, there aren't enough people to help organizations get there. And so you're going to start seeing innovation in the ICT community. I think in particular, uh, managed security services based out of the cloud, potentially uh, groupings, particularly in the lifeline sectors where they may have challenges, where they work together to buy in bulk uh, so that they can start to get scale of opportunity for managed security services. So I think about it, I hear most on the demand side, but I'd like to highlight that supply side exists as well. Yeah, just one item, again, from, a, uh, from an industry perspective, as you know, we build in an extended enterprise. I work, you know, across lot the commercial and the government side and, and looking at what, again, champions are doing. Microsoft's a great example. I mean, when we write work uh, an arrangement with a company like Microsoft, there's an SLA built in there. With it, and there's a, there's a huge security uh, piece to it. Um, that actually begins to look a lot like the framework. Um, and if we are all incentivized, kind of in this, this idea of bundled business, to, uh, to actually promote you know, common prosperity across the, an industry or sector, right? it's, it's not that you're losing competitiveness, you're actually increasing competitiveness by protecting risk on the, on the downside of your supply chain. That, that would be a way of actually incentivizing and just kind of building on, on Angela's comments here. Just one comment, because I've been <clears throat> sort of chomping at the bit to use this analogy here. And, um, you know, I used to get a discount on my insurance, you know, just, just for seatbelts, right? And, um, you know, now I get one for airbags, and I get one for being a good driver. So my analogy here would be the good driver discount is how well are you doing your risk management practice? Right? And your seat belts and your airbags are these controls that you implement. So if we can think about it like that, and that's kind of how I frame it in my head, which is, hey, here's a great way to incentivize. There's a lot of implications for how we roll that out, but when I look at that model, maybe it's a simple way to look at it. Yeah, Andy Purdy with uh, Huawei Technologies. First, a brief comment and two brief questions for Adam. I think the number one incentive for folks to use the analytical risk management framework, which is what the framework is, is the ability to sell your products and services. And while government is the one that's traditionally been emphasized, as, as uh, Angela just did, as Jim did in the CSAS Commission report, the number one incentive, and insurance someday will be helpful, but referring to the Dallas session, even the insurance panel said it's going to be years. But the incentive for folks that want to sell their products and services. But the idea, and my, my first question to, to Adam is, as you think about the work streams coming out of the framework, to what extent are you encouraging or, or do you now encourage the private sector, particularly sectors of private companies who have common interests in the kinds of things they buy and the kinds of th things that they need, the requirements they have for those that they sell to? 
to what extent does the private sector need to stand up in sectors and, and try to tell that story, try to, try to organize those buying requirements, those, those requirements for supply chain, those requirements, you guys call it conformity assessment, those requirements for product evaluation? If you'd like, I can ask the second question now or I can wait. Second question is, and I know it's not perfect, and I think it's arguably inconsistent with the traditional NIST model of uh, like 800-53, which is not to prioritize, it's to lay out a framework. Um, and there are those here that are better capable of me than saying this, but the top 20 controls, the success that's been demonstrated about what they can contribute to organizations now that have been vetted over time, is there a way that the NIST framework can, can recommend to folks, even though it's a form of prioritization, that the top 20 controls be part of the mix going forward? I can tell you that some of us have, uh, have uh, mentioned this to him once or twice, so. Uh. Well, so, you know, I'll, I'll say to, the, to, the, to this, I'll, I'll start with the second question, and I'll say, you know, um, the process that we laid out, and, you know, I remember Pat Gallagher talking about this at the CSIS event, you know, the, the director of NIST, is to see what's being used throughout industry and build off of that. So the, the critical controls are mapped in within the framework core, as is 853, which is also used throughout industry. You know, um, I was, you know, talking to uh, Ron Ross, and, you know, that document's been downloaded over, I think the last number we saw was over 5 million times since April, so who knows what, where it is now. Um, so both of those things have been proven to be very effective throughout industry. And I think the, one of the lessons of the framework process is, you know, it's less the, 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 the standard you use um, and it's, and it's uh, really the capabilities that you're trying to achieve. So, so both are in there. Um, and I think one of the discussions we had at our last workshop is, you know, the, the mandate under the executive order was to look at those true uh, cross-sector standards, but, you know, we also had about 300, 400 other entries from other um, specific industry standards. And so, you know, part of the work of NIST in its, stand, in, its, um, in its standards role is to really help the market with those and create, create something where um, those other standards can also be fit in for the organizations that choose to use them because it's proven to be effective to manage their risk. Um, on your first question, I mean, I think it is vitally important that we think about uh, the, the, the technological underpinnings and the, and the technologies that can be used to support the framework. I think that's one of the benefits of the framework getting out there is because it is truly cross-sector. Um, and, we, and we also highlighted the, we've highlighted since our first workshop the need for the conformity assessment programs also to be industry developed and industry run to the fullest extent possible. And I think that goes to Paul's point as well with true industry leadership. So, you know, we're putting out the roadmap also for comments, so we want to get feedback in terms of what other people think the priorities will be, and that will be another open comment period that we'll have. Since we're running a little short on time, maybe we've got a couple questions out there. If we could get the two questions and then let the panel respond to them both, and I'll make sure they do both questions. So, uh, in the back there first, and then uh, to the three questions, <laughs> and that's it. That's uh, my final offer. Thank you. This, this has been a great session. Um, Tim Stevens, GCS Intel, Actionable Intelligence for the financial sector. Um, I'm glad we brought up the issue of insurance. I mean, the uh, situation that we're in today is that the market is less than 1% of, of the underwriting for real estate. Uh, I don't think uh, that's where the value of the American economy is in its real estate, however valuable that is. Uh, I'd just be interested to hear the panel talk about how we close that gap and protect our intellectual property. Okay, uh, number two. That is a great question, by the way. Uh, Ashley Piles, Internet Security Alliance. And I'll say beta test and incentives there. I said the Larry <laughs> piece. Uh, but my other hat on the Council of Cybersecurity, I am on that board of review on the 20 critical controls that uh, Jane was mentioning earlier. And what I wanted, when FireEye brought up this question in Raleigh saying, where does the advanced threat fit into the framework? And we talked about it doesn't quite fit in there yet, and I think Paul articulated that very well. We're not, the framework doesn't go after that 5% of the threat, which is the advanced threat, and should we include it in this version instead of waiting till the next version or the day after to include it? 
also great. Thank you. Uh, we had one more, I think, uh, and then. Thank you. Wow, this has been a real learning curve for me. Uh, but bottom line is, this is great. I'm really, really enthusiastic about everything I'm hearing here. I'm a private investor, and every single solitary day I have oil tankers that go through the Straits of Hormoz. I have oil tankers that go through the Sudan. We've been dealing with risks that are dramatic for a very long period of time, just as you have in the Department of Defense, as you have in industry. What I'm hearing today, though, from all of you, is that there are some things that are ready to be done that are good to go. I think this gentleman continuously emphasized that. You've got tool manufacturers that I heard earlier, and hearing more about it, that have some tools that can identify and monitor and highlight and focus in on some of these things. At least one test bed she indicated earlier, uh, Jane Liu did, that the Australians had put up, uh, had been able to do some hardcore testing on this with these tools in place. So I would like to know, as a private investor, when are you going to move forward and get on with the job before you finish the policy, the rules, and the regulations? Great. So we had uh, three questions, uh, one on insurance, and uh, that one has bedeviled us for a long time, so it'll be interesting to see what the panel has to say. One on the prioritization of risk and whether we need to deal with uh, APT now. Another way to frame that would be, can we afford not to deal with APT now, but it's your choice, or it's a risk decision by people. It relates back to insurance to some ways. And then the third one is, when are we going to actually move out? And uh, some of us have been asking that question for a long time. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what the panel says. Did I capture the questions correctly? Okay. Uh, and we'll start with Bob and go down the row. On the on the insurance side, um, you know, where where I am now, we you know we have cyber risk insurance, um, and the challenge I think we have is is figuring out what the value is of cybersecurity. Uh, you know, building the actuarial tables, so to speak, the comprehensive insurance, the collision insurance. What's the model? You know, to frame this out so that it is intelligent uh, to not only a, a, a board and a CEO, but uh, to those that would provide the insurance. And I think we're, this provides another input into that process. Um, what we've basically uh, been doing is working pretty hard on benchmarking internally and then internally th th in the data center business you can you can benchmark across a lot of different sectors right and uh, that has helped us in terms of creating um, a relative valuation uh, of who does things well um, where do we need to put greater emphasis I think over time extrapolating that translating that into something that might be um, used on a, on a broader basis would be would be useful um, Currently, I think you know um, it's it, it, it's the right thing to think about. It's the next it's the next big cha challenge. But at the same time, um, j we we don't have the data. We haven't figured out I think a good model yet to really begin to provide uh, the heuristics to help us with uh, insurance valuation in this space. And so we sp we place a lot of effort, I think, a lot of energy, and, and, and more so in the recent. Um, uh, breaches that have been announced on other consequence management type activities. Um, so, so as we go forward in time, going back to Jim's question from about 20, 25 minutes ago, um, you know, if we, if we know a big bang is coming, what are we doing now about it other than traditional prevention and, pro and protection activities? I think we have to spend more time on consequence management. Um, and that's not just testing DR and business continuity plans and looking at PR strategies. I mean, that's, that's soup to nuts, kind of using almost like you see in the recover framework of NIST, but taking it, I think, back to business objectives. I mean, it's, in, in, the, in the business world, I mean, it's, it's really about, you know, how are we going to um, ensure um, that we've got viability with our stockholders um, and our stakeholders over time? And so reputational risk needs to be translated into some, some numbers uh, to help you figure that out. On the second question, prioritization of, uh, of risk and s specifically as we go forward with advanced persistent threat, um, there are models out there that, uh, that I think uh, are beginning to work. You know, as we build threat intelligence functions and we think about uh, methodologies like kill chain against APT, um, we think about uh, how we share information, I think was uh, actually something that the, the NIST framework, preliminary framework document called out in terms of information sharing. 
I think those are the right things. Um, my, my feeling, and, and again, we do this from where I sit in the data center world, we try to build counter APT campaigns, which helps us to prioritize risk as we uh, look at our customers and, and our suppliers and figure out what the prioritization should really be in, in, in terms of the viability of our ecosystem, right, which is a global ecosystem that, that goes across different industries. Um, and then in terms of moving out, I'm all, I'm, I'm all uh, uh, on, on board with that. I mean, uh, I think that was one of the challenges that I saw both in government and I see it in the private sector is, um, in the private sector, just by, by the very fact that you have to continue to grow business, um, you're moving out. Whether you're moving out in the right direction or not, I mean, that can be debated, but you're moving out in a direction. I think the, the key is to try to sort out um, the value of the direction you're moving in. In the Department of Defense, uh, you know, it was clear, you know, when I came into government the last time, uh, there was a desire to move out organizationally and, and making some changes as well as in, uh, in processes and in procedures and policy. Um, I think um, there, at least in the national security realm that, that I was a part of, um, my sense is there was incentive because we saw a real uh, clear and present danger uh, in the world of cyberspace. I think as people begin to um, begin to internalize that, whether it's on a corporate board or inside of a, uh, uh, a Pentagon, um, that's when people move out. Uh, you've got an incentive as you move ships and activities around the world, um, certainly um, though that, that supply chain, that physical supply chain, that e-commerce link needs to be protected in order for you to grow business and to continue to, to invest and attract other investors. So, so my sense is it it's really comes down to incentives and internalizing those incentives so that you, that you become the champion to move out. Thank you. <clears throat> Craig. So uh, with regard to insurance, um, I do have a little bit of experience in this um, space. I've you know, looked at the insurance models before. In fact, I went through a process. Um, and I have to tell you, I was pretty shocked at the questionnaire um, you know, when I went through the process. And the question seemed really simple to me. And I was thinking to myself, if I'm on the other side, boy, would I ask a lot more difficult questions here. Um, and I'd be asking about your advanced controls. I'd be asking about your risk management practices. And to be frank, it wasn't there. Um, and so it just kind of didn't smell right. And I was thinking to myself, how on earth are they going to underwrite based on these questions? Um, so, you know, I got to thinking and, um, and uh, you, you know, it just baffled me, that whole process that, you know, how, how is this model going to move forward without advancing? And I think for those organizations to be successful, they're going to need to really put tougher questions in there and actually push the organizations to do more in that area. Um, I'm going to kind of blend the second and the third uh, question because to me it's, um, it's all about the sophistication of the threat. And, and, you know, I'll be frank here too, I mean, when I was in critical infrastructure three and a half, four years ago, we put out a large program around advanced persistent threats. Uh, I didn't wait. I didn't wait for a document to come out. Um, so the problem is here and it's here now, and this again was three and a half, four years ago. Um, so what can we do differently? What do we need to do now? Um, you know, I think, you know, as I said, I think the framework's a great tool to start with. Um, we've got a core set in there, but I think, you know, there are kind of one or two avenues here. Either the core itself needs to be strengthened, sort of turned on its head a little bit to add some of these more advanced controls. Um, or it needs to be sort of feathered out by maturity level so that an organization can pick it up and say, oh, here's what those advanced organizations look like. And then the board can say, you, this is critical infrastructure, this is where you need to be. And so um, those are my thoughts in that area, and I do think we can do a lot more now. Um, and there's a lot of organizations that are moving forward already, and they're not waiting. Um, just one brief point on the insurance market, because I agree basically with both my colleagues here. I think there is not sufficient actuarial data. I do think that we see a lot of progress on the data breach side, and so if there's data breach and leakage of data, there is an insurance market that's forming more clearly around that. I think that the framework will help establish a part of a standard of care, but it's still hard to understand the consequences of an attack if it's not just a data breach. And so I think there's still a long runway. I think it, it will develop over time, but the runway is a little bit longer than um, we would like it to be necessarily. 
Um, when we talk about the framework doesn't go after APT, <clears throat> I would say yes and no. Um, I go back to this idea of horizontal, there's things that everyone should be doing, and then on top of that, I think about there being a vertical piece, that is, there are organizations that have higher risk profiles based on the national security type threats they are facing. And so I don't necessarily think that the framework is the best way and is, is dynamic enough to be able to deal with that, but I think the policy um, approach, both here domestically and internationally, needs to have a place to deal with that. Um, I just don't necessarily think the framework is the best place to deal with that vertical. Um, inside of the vertical, though, what I would say is there are some key practices, many of which have been talked about here today, under a bucket that I would call automated collective defense. So we really do need to be moving towards <clears throat> uh, better telemetry from products and services, being able to derive threat intelligence from those, being able to collaborate among communities, uh, protective communities to be able to work those issues, and then having an automated policy environment with actions that can be taken. Because ultimately, I think in that more advanced space, we're just gonna have to be a lot faster. Um, and then when we talk about, um, you know, when are we gonna move out? My, my only issue with that is it sounds like it's a start line and then we're moving out. And I would really agree with Craig, there's a lot of folks who've been moving out in this space for a really long period of time, um, ourselves included, um, whether it's doing things like um, botnet takedowns, which is not on the technical side, but is a campaign effort. Um, but I actually, in prepping for this particular meeting, reached out to one of my folks in network security, and I wanted, I was talking a little bit about this exact issue, and he said, you know, one of the things here, Angela, is we really have to remember the multidisciplinary aspect of this approach, and that there are going to be things that are campaign-like, there are gonna be things that are product improvements, there's gonna be collaboration among communities, but it's really a multidisciplinary effort that has already started and will continue to move forward. Um, I think, again, what we're doing here is we're kind of raising the awareness, um, and what the framework can do is it will make the APT a little easier to see, right? And so if we can reduce the signal-to-noise ratio, we can get rid of some of those everyday things. You'll be able to see the APT, and then those who are moving out will be able to work in that more dynamic way to help address it. Next. Okay, and the first question on insurance, um, I spoke to it a bit earlier. I do, I do remember a conference in uh, July of uh, 2003 in New York where the free insurance market came together to start to talk about cyber, and, and I I don't think a lot of progress has been made. And what was missing was the framework. Uh, and so my suggestion would be is for the insurance industry to work with innovators and the tech, tech industry to try to take what is encapsulated in the 20 controls and in the, in the framework and put together um, uh, the, the uh, a package that might ultimately be rolled out uh, to the private sector. And, uh, into certain industries uh, to begin with. I, I think starting with the critical infrastructure is probably not the right place to start because it's overly complex. To the second point on, um, on the framework, what it is, and what about the day after, and uh, my simple comment would be uh, to inoculate uh, everyone. Uh, <laughs> it, it would be uh, important to put a note up front in the framework as to what it is and what it is not. Uh, it, 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 and that's, you know, helps, the, it's almost a poison pill um, uh, for legislators and, and policy makers to say, oh, we'll just legislate this, this framework, and we need, we need to be clear about, uh, about that. Uh, and the third point on, um, uh, as far as um, moving out, I would agree with what everybody else has said. I think a lot of people have been moving out, and in, in the private sector in many ways has been moving forward and once again probably creating controversy. The irony of the Snowden affair and everything that has unfolded with government may be that private sector will now take security more seriously. Uh, we see a lot of chatter in the, in the paper about lots of big companies thinking more seriously about encryption and how they actually secure and that's really demand side generation. 
uh, customers will now be saying, how are you going to save me from government? And I don't think we ought to single out uh, the U.S. government here. Uh, frankly, um, there are a lot of other governments that uh, will be developing these kind of capabilities uh, if, if, uh, or will be thinking about developing these capabilities and, and for social management or whatever the issue may be. Yeah, I think one of the few benefits of the Snowden affair is it's one revealed how uh, in, unsecure the global networks are, and two, perhaps inadvertently, it's created an incentive that didn't exist before. So um, looking on the bright side, but it's a bold agency that would close its comments on uh, February, on Friday the 13th, and so for that reason, we'll give, uh, we'll give Adam the last word. Uh, thanks, and, and, I, and I appreciate uh, Jim hosting us. I appreciate all of you taking the time. I appreciate the organizations that have uh, taken, the, particularly that have taken the time to come to our workshops. Um, and that includes, I think Angela gets, gets a t-shirt for coming to all five of the workshops. Um, so I, I just wanted to thank everyone for that, and really, um, you know, we wouldn't be here if we didn't have that sort of, uh, that engagement. I think Ashley gets a t-shirt too. Um, that, that level of engagement and folks really working and thinking about these problems. Um, in terms of the, the, the questions, I mean, I, what the panel said, I, I really agree with uh, so much of it. I do think in terms of helping people understand what it is and what it is not um, is something we've thought about a lot in terms of what's the appropriate language. But, and I also think that there is a place for um, legislators in Congress to, to help us with that. I think that's one of the goals of the Rockefeller Thune bill. Um, I'll also say, you know, on the insurer, the, the, the conversation with the insurer, insurers has been really interesting. I think we, we've talked about there, there, is, there is a market there, so, so part of it will be leveraging that. And, and they've really, um, I, I thought the panel that we had in Dallas where we had the insurance companies talking about this and how they view it um, and, and how they view risk and how they help their customers manage risk was really interesting. I think it opened a lot of eyes for the critical infrastructure companies that were in the room. Um, so I think that will be part of the ongoing discussion because I think they are going to look really closely at this. Um, I really liked what Angela said about uh, Ashley's question about the APT. I think there are a range of things that an organization are going to do with that. Um, we did put out, um, when you think about sort of next steps, we did put out in August um, you know, to try to illustrate if the, the framework was truly extensible. We did put out some sort of threat models where we said, you know, if this is what you're trying to protect, here are some ways you can use the framework. So I think that's perhaps an important thing to look at. Um, but, you know, we'll, again, we'll, we'd love comments on that topic. Anything we can do to help improve the framework, we'll take. Um, and on moving out, I mean, I think we're ready to go. And I think uh, we are moving out. I think there's a lot of great work going on, both in the private sector and in government. And, uh, you know, it's, this is part of the process. It's an important one, and we'll continue to do this work. So thanks Adam, again. Adam, what's the link for submitting comments? Uh, if you go to nist.gov, you'll see it right on the right hand of the screen. In big letters. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs> and, and thank you very much for coming to this event. Thank you.